The following interview is conducted with David R. McInnes, uh, or the, the director of the Technical, uh, Technical Information Assistance Program and Assistant Vice Provost for Engagement for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, November 30th, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Dave, and thank Glad you very here. much. Let's start off, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Well, I was born just a couple miles from here in a now closed hospital, Lafayette Home Hospital. Okay. And that was in 1950, which is a good year to be born because it's easy to subtract and figure out what your age is. So, and I grew up on a farm in Warren County, not far from here. My mother was a second grade teacher, my father was a farmer, and uh, had three brothers and an uncle and he had two sons that worked on the farm and many, many others uh, way back long ago that it took to run a farm. What kind of uh, farm did your father have? Well, when I was growing up, we had livestock okay. and wheat, oats, okay. corn, soybeans, chickens, cows, cattle, Quite a hogs, thing, all sorry. the normal things you had long ago on a farm. Did you, where'd you go, uh, go to grade school there? And let's talk about grade school and high school. Went to a grade school in a little uh, town in Warren County called Green Hill and a little grade school called Green Hill that has long since been closed that just had um, 80 students and four rooms for eight grades, four teachers, four paddles. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. yeah, and no gym, just uh, four rooms and a cafeteria. Okay. What about high school? Where'd you go to high school? And tell us about any student clubs and your program, sure. et cetera. Well, I went to high school in Otterburn, Indiana for two years, and then that high school was consolidated with a school in a very small town of Montmorency, Indiana, near here. Went there for my uh, final two years of high school, and that school at that time was called Benton Central, and now, um, since that time, is a new newer, large uh, school near Fowler. Mm -hmm. But my activities in high school were banned, and the sports that were available, which at that time was only the guys, and that was uh, basketball, baseball, and track. Okay. And you had to run cross country if you wanted to play basketball, and I hated running cross country, but you had to do that <laughs> if you wanted to play basketball. You had so. to take that entry point. That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, then what came next? Uh, where'd you go to college? Well, I knew through my high school days that I wanted to go be an engineer. And uh, my uh, parents took me uh, to two places, Rose Holman and to Purdue, to look at the programs. And I liked both, but uh, selected Purdue. My father is a Purdue agricultural, uh, or College of Agriculture alumnus, and very much enjoyed Purdue. All right. So. Okay. Tell us about campus and uh, the <coughs> program and the professors, et cetera. Do you live on well, campus? Well, yeah. I started out in uh, Cary Quadrangle in the uh -huh. residence hall there, and then uh, my next three years in Sigma Nu fraternity. Uh, campus in uh, this was in 1968 when okay. I uh, began. About 20, if I, as I recall, 27,000 students. Uh, I was in engineering, so it was almost exclusively male uh, at that time and has changed a little bit since then, but not considerably. Uh, Barry, um, uh, it was in engineering all four years, uh, went through an engineering science. Uh, very difficult, very challenging. Uh, most students were uh, very st studious, including myself, and I did well, but it was uh, very hard work okay. all the way, all the way through. But very rewarding. I really enjoyed it. All right. Any student organizations did you go to the, the Student Council of Engineering? I right. my greatest participation was in the Purdue um, Union Board um, activities. I was a member of the Union Board my junior year and uh, participated in my sophomore year in that, and then uh, was in various leadership roles in my fraternity, and those were the the two main activities I had. Okay, sounds but, good. But uh, none of those compared to homework. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then did, then you went on to the School of Management afterwards when you graduated. Did you get your master's after that? 
I did something uh, that's unusual today. I went directly from engineering into a Master of Science and Management program here, here at, at Cranert. Uh, by the time I was about a junior, uh, you know, I talked to a lot of my fraternity brothers and others uh, about career paths and a, um, um, these are, degrees are now called MBAs. That um, degree was very high demand at that time and it sounded good to me and so that's what I des decided to do. So I went um, right into the uh, Craner program. Uh, was was uh, married uh, after uh, the completion of my bachelor's degree. Uh, my wife and I both uh, graduated at the same time here at Purdue. And the uh, program I was in, I ended up taking three semesters kind of in, in a summer for my master's program, but started working with a company called Duncan Electric uh, my last semester. Okay. So oh. it was a great experience and um, was in the, the Master of Science and Management was very helpful to my, right. my career. Good combination there. Yeah, okay. it was. Uh, look about career path before you came to Purdue. Tell us about some of the, you had a couple positions. Well, I After you got your master's. Is that yeah? You? While I was, in, you know, in the process of completing my master's degree, I uh, took a job with a local company called Duncan Electric. It's now been purchased uh, by a company called Landis and Gear, Swiss company. But at that time, uh, they had a major manufacturing facility here, over a thousand employees, and they wanted some MBAs. And they had had very good experience with some others, and they also had very good experience with some graduates with degrees in engineering science, and I had both of those degrees. And so I went into uh, manufacturing, was involved in production management, and involved in implementing uh, what at that time was novel, was um, computer systems for materials, called material requirements planning systems. And uh, then uh, eventually there became a um, uh, production manager and production superintendent. Very High volume, challenging work um, in the manufacturing at that time. Very competitive right. and uh, much different from the world of manufacturing today. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. So you had a couple positions, and then did, is that when you, after you worked, in the, is that when you came back to Purdue? or? Well, I, I spent about eight years there. Then I went uh, in um, about 1981 to Caterpillar here in Lafayette, which was just beginning to. Uh, gear up to produce uh, or to uh, build their new facility at that time. And uh, I spent about four and a half years there. In 1982 was when first production began of large diesel engines from the facility here in Lafayette, Indiana. So when I started there, there were about 90 employees. And when I left, I, there were several hundred. And today it's around 1,500. And, um, an enormous facility making a tremendous amount of product and a lot of it's it is big, exported. A lot of the land out there. <laughs> Huge. And so that was a, a great experience because a large international company which had a very sophisticated, always using the best technology for production and for uh, management of production and for everything they do is a very well managed company and Caterpillar consistently receives very high rankings as one of the best managed companies in America. and then. Uh, in 1985, I left Caterpillar to become a, a promotion with a uh, small company in Holland, Michigan called Thermotron, makes up uh, environmental test chambers, and at that time was doing mostly work for defense contractors having to do with Star Wars um, development, and our products were test chambers that people in the defense uh, contractor industry needed. And so that was another uh, very, very good experience because I was reporting directly to the president, extremely profitable company, was there at the right time uh, making products that were in very high demand, and then left there to come to Purdue. Okay. How did the, uh, how did you, how did you <coughs> get the position at Purdue, how did you have to come back? Well, I uh, was only in Michigan a short time and uh, noticed a advertisement in the Indianapolis Star back in those days. The way you found a job was primarily by looking at ads in a newspaper. And <laughs> very, it's a not normal way today. Sure. But 
Uh, it was an ad in Indianapolis Star for a Purdue Technical Assistance Program, and at that time, the uh, criteria, the, the Technical Assistance Program had just been established with uh, new funding from the legislature in 1986. And a few months later, they posted a position for an associate director. A director was selected who was uh, Min Hilberry, professor in mechanical engineering. And the uh, mission of the program was economic development and primarily in the manufacturing sector, which was much larger back then than it is today, in a much more significant part of Indiana's economy. So it made sense for the state to invest in that sector at that time. Well, my background was a very good fit with this, and I knew uh, some of the faculty that were initially involved, and so uh, when I went through the interview process, knew a few of the people, and um, it worked out that I received the offer. Okay. So. Sounds good. Let's talk about that. Tell us a little bit of how did it evolve, the history of the, yeah. is it from the legislature initially, or is it? Well, it's, it's from both. In okay. the early 1980s, uh, there was a severe recession in the United States, and in Indiana, we, at that time, I believe, lost about half of our jobs in the steel industry in northwest Indiana, for example. And as a result of that, the governor uh, had, at that time, a major uh, strategic planning effort uh, led by some very professional people that involved universities and many others throughout the state that resulted in I think it was something like 150 recommendations, and some of those recommendations involved universities, and one of the ones that involved universities said, let's get Purdue involved in direct technical assistance with the business sector, thinking mainly manufacturing sector. And there was funding, which at that time was about $600,000 a year, to get that started. And so the uh, legislature funded many of the uh, items of this strategic plan that was done by a bipartisan group of probably hundreds of people involved in it one way or another at that time. And so that funding began in 1986. Very. Uh, it's, now, of course, they always, being a land-grant institution, we always had the county extension uh, so that there was something working with, within the community. Uh, and this one is, a, is different because the focus is manufacturing. Foc and, yes. Well, the focus at that time was manufacturing, right. but the, the broader yeah. focus was the business sector. Right, exactly. Okay. Um, then you were the associate director and then <clears throat> became director. How much about some challenges and opportunities when you moved up? Well, <laughs> absolutely, but uh, <laughs> it, it was, um, um, we, we, for the first 16, or excuse me, 14 years of the program, we had four excellent professors as director. They were all, all four were great to work with. And then uh, in the year 2000, it became possible for me to sure. accept an offer to become director. And uh, it was an opportunity I wholeheartedly sought <laughs> and welcomed and am very pleased to have um, taken 10 years ago. And I uh, don't uh, think of these, uh, of my experience as director as, um, I, I think of it as a great opportunity and right. a lot of fun. Right. And it certainly has been hard work, but hard work that I've welcomed with open arms. Right. So, in, the, in that interim, though, you were working primarily with Purdue faculty, you had grad students as well? Correct. Right. Tell me, the researchers, what are some of the things that they were involved in? Well, in time? our... Uh, in the initial... For first... Uh, 14 years when I was associate director, and this right. part continues today, we, o we would always have about 20 or 25 faculty and graduate students involved doing 250 or so projects per year with the business sector. And so, for example, a company came to us one day and, and said, we're making some metal parts for General Electric. They go into a locomotive, and they say, that these parts don't meet their specifications, and we say they do. Would you have your metallurgist give us a call on this? And so we had one of our faculty, Sam Hureska in materials engineering, who's now passed away, did an analysis. He said, this absolutely meets the spec that General Electric has for you. And they showed that to General Electric, and General Electric said, okay, we agree with you. And the company said, you know, otherwise, they, it, they might have had to shut down. Could have been 40 people out of a job because they had this significant disagreement. And these things happen in industry all the time. Yeah. They're, they're not 
this, this was not an easy question for us, but very, uh, very uh, capable faculty member was able to answer that. And so faculty and graduate students have done many projects like, mm -hmm. like that over the years. The faculty are from multi-disciplines, yeah. primarily, both en what engineering and management? They are uh, engineering, technology, science, and management. Okay. And occasionally, uh, other colleges participate. Uh, sure. Too and in the, at that time. Now these days we have significant participation from the health disciplines, so health science, nursing. Right, and we'll talk a little um, bit about that. We'll get into programs. later. Um, how do you contact the client? Do they come to you, uh, your clients, or how has that has that changed over time? Well, it works both ways. Okay. Uh, obviously, when we got started, we had to sure. contact the clients. Now the way that that was done before the internet era was by sending brochures and going to rotary clubs and luncheons and uh, radio shows that have to do with business right. and television and those sorts of things. But most of it was done by brochures. And then um, as time goes on, went on, of course, more and more people learned about us from very, in various magazines. We'd be in the Chamber of Commerce magazine, the Purdue Alumnus magazine, all, all the different publications we could uh, get into. And so that continues today that we contact companies and they contact us. Right. Works both ways. It's a two-way street there. Yes. Right. The growth and expansion is really grown. You have quite a few offices now. Talk about that and your funding, the support. Sure. For that. Well, TAP uh, has, in terms of number of people involved and companies served for its first 20 years, was roughly um, even. Had a very, and this was a very good level of work. Lots of impacts. Very well received. In uh, early 2005, a little over, get close to six years ago, several things happened at the same time that have increased the size of TAP since then by about six times. So today our program in terms of funding is about nine or ten million dollars a year. At that time it was around a million and a half dollars a year. But what uh, happened was several um, initiatives at the same time and one was um, five, uh, in early 2005, Purdue University's university received the award from the Regan Street Foundation to establish a Regan Street Center for Healthcare Engineering. And that funding resulted in other funding streams coming to Purdue from the Indiana Hospital Association and the Indiana State Department of Health where they said, we need a group that can work with us on um, many, many different aspects of healthcare, mm -hmm. public health and working in hospitals that have interdisciplinary teams, industrial engineers, nurses, and other disciplines. And for those uh, purposes, we started Healthcare TAP in early 2005, a division of TAP that has since uh, grown significantly and today has about 30 full-time employees uh, statewide uh, working on a very broad range of uh, aspects of healthcare. And then at the same time, back in uh, 2005, the state of Indiana chose to move a um, federally funded center called Manufacturing Extension Partnership from a, another state agency to Purdue University because it was a very good fit with the work TAP was already doing in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And so that uh, federally funded center, uh, which is funded by the National Institute for Standards and Technology mm -hmm. as well as state funding and other funding, uh, came to be part of TAP and remains there today and is a very synergistic with everything we do. And then, we, in addition to that, in recent years have begun to perform at the request of the Indiana, Indi the state of Indiana's uh, Department of um, um, Energy and Defense Management, a lot of work for the Department, U.S. Department of Energy on energy efficiency. And also, about three or four years ago, uh, Purdue obtained a $15 million grant to um, do innovation and regionally economic development. And a large part of that grant was uh, used, uh, invested in TAP. And one of the things we did with that was develop a green enterprise development system for energy efficiency and how companies can use green principles in everything they do, whether it's manufacturing or an office. And that green enterprise development system has now been 
uh, taken by over a thousand people and several states have uh, centers and community colleges having us go teach them how to, to use this. We're in about half the states with that center now. So, Catherine, it's a, a set of many things that all happened in 2005 and six that have uh, enabled um, us to partner with more people than we ever thought possible and uh, work in every county in the state on health care and business issues. Wow. So. You were that, you got, uh, you were PI, PI for one of these grants, aren't you, on, that you got, um, that, um, well, you were talking about the uh, Indiana Health Net Technology Research, but yeah. you got some grant and you were a PI for one of them, a co-PI? Correct. Yeah. What was uh, back in, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, in February of 2009, the um, federal, um, at the federal level, uh, we had a stimulus bill passed that obviously everyone's familiar with. And that uh, bill included uh, legislation to help primary care physicians across the United States implement electronic health records. In last mm -hmm. February, February of 2010, uh, Purdue received the award to the Office of Engagement to, of $12 million to assist 2,200 physicians in Indiana in primary care select and implement electronic health records in their practices. And most of that funding is uh, being implemented through a new center <coughs> in TAP called Indiana Health Information Technology Extension Center. And our region is most of the state of Indiana. And, and uh, there are 60 of these centers in the United States. So right now we have um, uh, an objective of helping 2,200 physicians do this. And we have 550 signed up to get started. So we're beginning right now with uh, 550. Nationwide, there are about a quarter of a million primary care physicians, and this nationwide effort has the objective of getting 100,000 of those up and running on electronic health records. And by the way, most of these quarter of a million do not have very much in the way of electronic health records in mm -hmm. place. And, and, That's and, a real challenge. Yeah, when you go to specialties such as cardiology and radiology and other specialties, you'll make, see a much higher rate of adoption. But among the primary care physicians and pediatricians, the rate of adoption today is very low, uh, very low. Uh, so this is very exciting because it's right. it's um, something that affects all of our all of us because That's we right. almost all use a primary care physician. Right. Is it a lot in the rural, are you going in the rural areas as well? Yes. Okay. Yes. It, it, That's uh, a challenge. It, it, well, it, it is, and we, um, uh, but, but this whole program has a very strong rural objective. And the way it is set up is that the um, uh, emphasis is on pr small practices of just very few physicians. And so that means in many cases, uh, you'll be in rural areas. Obviously the objective eventually is for 100% well, sure. participation, and I'm sure that will happen uh, in time. But uh, there'll be a significant increase in adoption over the next couple of years with, with this center. Yeah, that sounds so. good. Um, the, uh, what's the, the uh, liaison with the local community uh, do you do in Tippecanoe County? Have you got some things with TAP, and is that one of the areas that uh, you have some projects going on? Well, or TAP has always done a great amount of work in Tippecanoe County, and location, obviously, is the reason. Right. But as we've ex expanded, starting about five years ago, we have staff in 10 um, cities around the state. Most of our statewide staff are involved in the manufacturing sector, but a few are involved in healthcare. And in total today, we have about 50 uh, full-time people. And about 30 of those are here and about 20 at other places around the state. Mm -hmm. But in Tippecanoe County, obviously we're close. We do a lot of support for companies in the Purdue Research Park, and it's a very good investment of state funding because these are very high potential companies with high paying jobs and right. the uh, potential to create hundreds if not thousands more in the future. So TAP is very active here in Tippecanoe County. Yeah, sounds good. A couple of your activities that you mentioned. One is your internship there <clears throat> for the students. Could you take a couple comments on that? And then I think the high-tech job fairs. Yeah. 
Well, we've had, uh, when we go back into the uh, 1980s when we began, a lot of companies say, hey, I like what you're doing for me. Help me find some students in engineering or technology or science to work for for the summer. And so we did, and we, we started a some we started a program that was for summer only, summer intern program. And over the years, we placed about a thousand students uh, over the about a twenty year period of time in companies with excellent results. And some of these students were um, uh, named on patents that that were developed uh, by companies. Some of them were asked to quit school, not go back, just stay there. <laughs> Some of them we like uh, what you're doing. Some of them graduated and then <laughs> sure. went back full time, and and uh, about a third of them over that period of time told us that they did work part time when they went back to school for the company. So it was very very well received. Then in recent years, with the significant um, uh, improvement in our computer matching options with Center for Career Opportunities here at Purdue. Uh, companies have begun saying it's easy for me to find students, it's easy for students to get into the Center for Career Opportunity system. So they're not, um, so that era of us helping them directly is now still happening, but they're being helped directly through Tim Luzader and, and his staff in the Center for Career Opportunities. So w we met a need that uh, couldn't be met any other way, and now they're, the same thing is happening, but in a different way. Now, uh, High Tech Job Fair, back in the late uh, 90s, when there was this enormous internet uh, dot-com boom, Indiana companies would just say, we are begging and pleading, we can't get students in computer science or any of the computer disciplines uh, to work for us. And so, um, Warren Stevenson, who was an associate uh, head of mechanical engineering at that time, said, well, why don't we just have a High Tech Job Fair and the only body, no one can come unless you're an Indiana company. And Warren called me up one day and he said, what do you think about that? And I said, Warren, I think it's one of the best ideas I've heard in a long time. He said, okay, you do it. <laughs> so a few months later, we, we had a high-tech job fair. We had 100 companies here. And um, later that year, we did it again, and we had even more companies here. And I remember um, uh, Lieutenant Governor Kernan coming to one of these along with our new president at that time, uh, Martin Jiski, and we we were just absolutely packed. And we and so we did that for 10 years, and, in, and again in recent years, here on campus, right here on campus, okay. or right here in the Purdue unions, it was for all students of Purdue anywhere in the state, and if students from another university called us and said, well, can we come, we said yes. So we would have students from Alparaiso University or any university didn't matter. The employers um, were glad to see anyone who met their requirements. And so that, that went very well. And in recent years, uh, Purdue has added dozens of special events. And also the way that uh, jobs are uh, matched up between students and employers is moving more and more to internet-based. And so the uh, high-tech job fair uh, run ended about a year ago and is, again, employers still get the same students, but now they're doing it with the uh, multitude of other events that Purdue has that are very well attended and well subscribed, as well as directly through the Center for Career Opportunities. So both High Tech Job Fair and the interns were great needs that ran for a period of time and and now there's other ways that companies right, exactly. meet those needs. I was going to so. ask you what the liaison with that, with the with CCO. You worked together with them? Absolutely. Okay. All the way through, all okay. ever since the late 90s. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. <clears throat> Associate Vice Provost for Engagement, uh, tell us a little about that. Sure. Yeah. Well, in approximately um, 2000, um, under uh, President uh, New at that time, President Jiski, uh, the position of Vice Provost for Engagement was created. Um, the term engagement meaning um, primarily partnering with other organizations for mutual benefit. And uh, President Jiski was highly committed to this and helped uh, lead a nationwide uh, effort to get major universities that are land grant more significantly involved in their communities and states and regions. And uh, that first vice, vice provost for engagement was Don Gentry. 
And then a couple of years later, uh, he named, uh, I believe at that time, three other people to, uh, for part of their role to be an associate vice provost for engagement. And so at that time, um, about 2002, I believe, was the year uh, part of my role became an associate vice provost for engagement. So in addition to my duties as director of TAP, I would be involved in uh, the chamber, commerce, and the state chamber, and um, other organizations throughout the state representing all of Purdue in, in those efforts, and that continues today. Okay. So sounds, it's an exciting true. role. Yeah. The, um, let's talk about the Technical Information Service and TAP. Uh, and I remember a little bit about that because it was tied in with the, sure. the library. Yeah. Well, the Technical Information Service uh, began oh. right at the very, within the first year of TAP. And right. uh, again, that it, it's a, um, a need that was significant and uh, was ex very, very well uh, met by the Purdue Library System. And the objective of the te Technical Information Service was to get Indiana businesses information that they needed quickly on, on whatever topic it was to support the growth of businesses in, in the state. And so uh, we had a staff of up to 10, sometimes even 12, uh, professionals who uh, received requests for information and processed and shipped out tens of thousands of documents, physical hard copies, uh, per year. And we had options where in some cases it could be uh, out within 24 hours or faxed um, immediately within you know a few minutes or an hour if Purdue had the documents in our own collections. And if we didn't, we w we didn't always have everything in our own collections, and so uh, we would get those from wherever that needed to be. And so the TIS uh, ran for about 20 years, and obviously in the 2000s and late 90s as the um, Internet and web technologies came online and more and more information became available online, the demand uh, lessened. But the program ran very strong right, right up uh, to the end, and the... Um, uh, library system at Purdue just did an outstanding job. The service was was excellent, on time, um, very quick turnaround, and, uh, and until it, until the need for that was replaced by new technology, right. it, it, was, needed, it was it a was a go-to really place needed as TAP was growing and people were knowing about it and they need the literature so so they could check and that's where that served. That's help right. In that. And the need for all of that information is greater today than it ever was before. And it's like the job fair and interns. <laughs> it's just, it's obtained in different methods. Exactly, balance. I know what you mean, right. And, uh, are there similar programs, uh, Dave, in surrounding states such as TAP, do you know? There are, there are about a, a dozen. Within the, within the region, yes. within the Midwest. Uh, Kentucky has a TAP program, and okay. they, they all have different names than TAP. Okay. Tennessee has a, an excellent one. Kentucky has an excellent one. Uh, Georgia Tech has an outstanding TAP program. The um, North Carolina State University has an outstanding uh, TAP program. Uh, Penn State has one. Maryland, um, University of, uh, excuse me, Iowa State has one, and, and a few others. They're about, depending how you count them, 12 to 15 that are okay. roughly similar, where the university has said this is um, an excellent way to work with the business sector. So they're housed, they're stationed within they, the university And they're all framework. stationed somewhere within the university, in some cases in the College of Engineering, in some cases in, as is the case with Purdue, in an Office of Engagement or an Office of Outreach, okay. and um, it, and other other. Uh, organizational st structures throughout the universities. Right. So. Do you ever, people ever get together, the heads of these? Yeah, well, we do a, a uh, get together, and over oh. the years, uh, I have uh, once or about an average of once a year, several sure. of us get together. Extremely helpful. And we go to each other's um, universities and learn how we do things and network and um, learn what's working well and what doesn't. Very, very helpful. 
All right. And what are some of the new things and issues that you've engaged in, too? You can share with that. Well, the newest uh, for all of us is working in healthcare, uh, significantly, because all of these programs uh, that are um, I'm referring to, I think almost all of them are 10 to 30 years old. And the focus of all of them was the business sector and primarily manufacturing. And now there's much more to do. We're going into biotechnology and information technology sectors, life science sectors, and I think almost all of us are now moving into the healthcare sector, working with hospitals and clinics and uh, nursing homes, electronic health records, public health, and all those things. Because the healthcare sector of our economy is huge and has grown substantially, as we all know, over the past 50 and years. And even more is growing. And it, and it has um, a, almost all studies indicate that, and this is just a general statement, that there's a lot of room for improvement in the way we um, provide health care and at the same time improving patient care. So there's ways to do all of this at less cost and with better patient care. Mm -hmm. And we're certainly finding that through our work in health care tech. Yeah, I that, would think that so. That this is possible. Right, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, do you have the, uh, you still have your advisory council, the yes. uh, technical assistance, do they do what, meet, what, annually or? Well, our advisory council meets twice a year okay. for a full day here on campus and has uh, normally about 21 members who are um, on three-year terms. And so they meet six times and we, uh, find it to our advantage to have more business leaders in the state that know about us than fewer, so we have three-year terms. And so over the years, we've had about 150 um, terrific, successful businessmen, businesswomen on our advisory council. And again, we meet twice a year. We um, cover a tough topic and get their input on how can Purdue better serve the business sector in the healthcare sector in Indiana, and we get good input. We receive very good input and participation. Are they primarily from Indiana, or do you have some from outside? Well, this, this particular council oh. is only from Indiana okay. because they're primarily involved with the parts of TAP that serve Indiana only. Right. Okay, so which is your primary focus. In, yeah, TAP works a little bit, 95 plus percent of our work sure. is in the state. Right, so. okay. Um, how about family? Um, well, my wife, uh, Kathy, uh, was um, or graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Education. From Purdue? From Purdue. Okay. And then um, later on while teaching in, as an elementary teacher, received a Master of Science in Education. And she recently uh, completed, you know, 30, close to 40 years okay. and uh, retired from uh, teaching here in West Lafayette as a second grade teacher in um, recent years is where, where she's been. Okay. Then we have um, two sons. Uh, one is uh, 29 years old. He's an aeronautical engineering graduate of Purdue and has been with uh, General Electric Turbine Engine Division. It's based in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. He uh, started with them as a co-op uh, his sophomore year and then took full-time employment with them when he graduated in 2005 and has been in many locations here and abroad with them since. And uh, our other son, younger son, is um, 26 and he went to the University of Tennessee uh, to study nuclear engineering and then um, graduated 2007 and came here for a Master of Science in Biomedical Engineering. Here? Here, here at Purdue and uh, completed that degree earlier this year. And about a year and a half ago, while still working on his master's degree, took a position with a new unit of Cook here in the Purdue Research Park. And his uh, wife, Amy, also graduated in 2007 from the University of Tennessee as an English major, and she is a high school English teacher at Jeff High School. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> the family is nice, there for Nice to have them nearby. So. Um, any hobbies, special interests? Well, I um, have a woodworking shop in my basement. And okay. <laughs> I've actually spent a lot of hours in there. 
<laughs> just in re recent days, I've done uh, a lot of a lot of woodworking. We have uh, Kathy and I re refinished lots of antiques over the years. Her grandparents collected and refinished antiques, and um, when we were dating and first married, her grandfather taught me how to do these things, and I'm right. still doing those today. And st even still have a few of his very old. Um, tools from, from long ago. But we um, also like bike riding and we have a sailboat on Lake Freeman nearby and don't do that as often as we like to. <laughs> no. But uh, I understand. Uh, it's a lot like, of fun things to do. Yeah, so. it's like Studebakers, you know, you like to drive them but you don't have time. That's right. <laughs> uh, a couple of the, you got quite a few of honors. Uh, <clears throat> talk about the one brick hire that you received. Well, that's a uh, very um, humbling and you know delightful honor because one brick higher award uh, when when I received it and I, I'm not sure what the criteria are today but when I received it a few years ago it was based on a nomination from your peers and so my uh, buddies how did you find out about did you know in, a little bit in advance or no nothing people there? no that's great Nope, you don't find out about it I just uh, <laughs> they, uh, one day my boss <laughs> uh, my well I was told in advance that I had been given the award and the date it would be given, of course, and to be sure. there. I understand. But I had no idea it was in, in the work. So that was a very um, uh, delightful and pleasant surprise, and it's very humbling because, yeah. again, your peers nominate you and That's the nice make thing that about happen. it. Yeah. And well, you also got the Provost Seed Award. Well, that... That's very is, nice. is also very for the grant, right? Very um, uh, delightful award to receive because it has it, it, it's given to those who are principal investigators or co PIs on okay. awards of a million dollars or more. Right. And uh, what you receive is a uh, I believe it's a brass acorn that says "Seeds of a Success" and it has your name inscribed on it. And it's just a very very um, uh, pleasant uh, award to receive. Very yeah. nice. Very nice, so. yes. And the um, Innovation Award, that TAP got that from the Wabash Center. Well, Wade. you know, that it just speaks highly of the faculty and graduate students at Purdue. The Wabash Center, uh, TAP has done a lot of projects with Wabash Center and other um, ARCs or similar centers around the state over the years. And these centers employ thousands of uh, people with full capabilities and, and hundreds and I'm sure it's thousands of, of our citizens that have limited right. mental or physical capabilities. So they, uh, and they do work for industry, they do work for all kinds of businesses, it's competitive and uh, so it makes a very strong impact when you can help them be more productive or solve problems or set up production better. And our, Faculty and graduate students over the years have just done many great projects right here in town, and we're delighted to see that yeah. recognition a, because we really want to help center. them, and right. and it was much appreciated by their right. yeah. their organization. And then you got the MEP Newcomer of the Year Award. Well, that was in I believe 2005, and the MEP is Manufacturing Extension Partnership, and there are 59 or eight of these centers. Every state has one, some states have two. And uh, it came to Purdue in 2005, and uh, or it was moved in Indiana. Indiana Center was moved to Purdue in 2005 when we received the award. And again, just speaks very highly of uh, David Snow and his staff and many others with that organization. Worked very hard to make an impact in manufacturing. Yeah. So. Uh, community memberships, you, are you the uh, West Chamber of Commerce? Are you still involved with that? Been very actively involved with the Chamber for many years. In, uh, or vice chair. Uh, are you still the vice chair? Or? Well, I will be vice chair in next August okay. of the Greater Lafayette Chamber of Commerce Council and uh, have been on the Chamber Council for I mean, my fourth year now. Prior to that, was involved in several other uh, committees for the chamber. The Lafayette Chamber consistently has about 950 members. They do very, very well. It's an organization that works very hard to serve businesses here in town. All right, that's good and, contact uh, too. Purdue is always heavily involved and should be. 
Right. And um, obviously Purdue does a significant amount of business as, as we want to with local companies right here in Tibingham County. Yeah, exactly that. Um, any uh, questions that I forgot to ask? Or, and I'll about TAP in the next biennium. What, uh, comment on that? Well, uh, uh, TAP's, uh, I, I will comment on that. Good. And uh, TAP's funding uh, in this fiscal year, about 20% will be from state appropriations. And about 80% is from other sources. And in any given year, the number of different funding sources is about 100 to 150. So mm -hmm. we're very diversified. Uh, you know, Purdue's legislative request for the next biennium is level funding, and so that's the request for TAP, and our that number is about $1.8 million. And um, hopefully that happens. If it goes down a little, yeah. uh, we will continue to do good work sure. as best we can. But Catherine, I think the, the question would be, Maybe you're going to get to is you know what's the next five years right. or the next ten years. Good, and, right, exactly. And it's always hard to predict the future, but I think it's very obvious that Purdue as a whole and TAP in particular are going to be um, more involved than ever in everything we're doing uh, involved within the state, the state's economy, right. uh, supporting the business sector, and there's no question we're going to become more and more involved every year in. Our work in the healthcare sector. And for example, I recently uh, met with the 22 members of the faculty of industrial engineering, and I asked them, How many of you are doing research of some kind or another in healthcare? And two thirds, three fourths are. And so that's an indication of the future for Purdue and uh, where our efforts, both in research and outreach, are going to be. So I I think the um, um, kind of work that our faculty, staff, and students do through TAP and through our research organizations is very well received and will continue to be and that we'll continue to do significant work here in the state and in many cases beyond. Right. And it's made so, its mark and it had a big impact. And Yes, and that's, again, just a great testament to the dedication of um, our faculty in industrial engineering and throughout the university who have worked very hard to right. make an impact. And the recipients are the same way. They appreciate yes, it too. So it's absolutely. a two-way thing and it comes together. That's right. Yeah. Dave, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to interview for our oral history program. Thank you very you, much. You're welcome. Delighted <laughs> to be here. <clears throat>